Hugh and Thurston had been in the editor's office for over an hour. I vaguely knew that at some point Thurston had asked Damon as well as Alec to join them in the office, and that sometime later Lem was called in as well. But I didn't respond to the strange fact that Rhea, Minnie, and I were left outside. I asleep, Minnie and Rhea wondering what was going on but far too hostile toward each other to start a conversation. I woke up when Alec stormed out of the editor's office and slammed the door behind him. What in hell is going on in there? What's all this shouting about and why aren't we in on it? Minnie asked him. Alec sat down next to me. I could see he was agitated. Were you fighting in there about that dumb editorial, I asked? I'll tell you exactly what's going on in there, he said. It's the dirtiest shit I've ever seen. Hugh and Thurston had worked out a filthy strategy when Damon and I were called in. I made such a stink about it that they dropped it. But then Thurston convinced all four of them to accept an even filthier scheme, so I walked out. Can you hold yourself together enough to tell us about it, Minnie asked him. Thurston had this idea that we ought to publish an off-campus paper, Alec began. Rhea interrupted him to say, that wasn't Thurston's idea, it was mine, Alec. So it was, I remember that now. Sophie was the only one who responded when you suggested it. That was your idea. God damn them. Saying this, Alec shook his fist at the door of the editor's office. Well, they stole it from you, Rhea. That's what happened. Thurston loves your idea, but he doesn't want you to be part of it. He convinced Hugh that if you and Lem were both on the staff, he, Thurston, would soon quit. He would be outnumbered, and the paper would become a propaganda sheet, and when Thurston says propaganda sheet, he makes it sound like toilet paper with shit on it. Even if he didn't say it that way, you know that Hugh must have nightmares about being caught in a paper that's biased. Fair and responsible, he's got those damn words etched on his brain. He thinks he's still editing the university paper. When they call Damon and me in, Thurston tells them we're going to put out this off-campus paper, all of us except Lem and Rhea. I ask what's wrong with Lem and Rhea. That fucker Damon grins and doesn't say anything. I tell Hugh and Thurston I don't understand. Hugh tells me this shit about not putting out a propaganda sheet, and then I do understand. I start shouting and telling Hugh and Thurston to crawl to the administration, ask to be forgiven, and beg to be rehired on the administration-run paper. I tell them they're about to do to Lem and Rhea exactly what the administration just did to us. Hugh pretends he'd never thought of that and says I'm right. I argue that if we're going to put out that kind of sheet, we've got to include every single member of the fired staff, even Bess if she's not about to sell out to the administration staff. At that point, Thurston calls Lem into the office, and I'm under the impression that I won the argument. But that Thurston is as slippery as a fish. He explains the idea to Lem and then tells him that all the men in the staff are going to put out the off-campus paper. That blockhead Lem says that he understands that. He starts talking about how dangerous it is to publish what he calls an underground newspaper, much too dangerous for women. Thurston has to cool Lem down when he starts talking about a revolutionary underground paper. I shout at Lem and call him a stupid asshole. I tell him that a minute ago it was he who was being excluded, but I can see that he's enchanted about being included. Lem may be your comrade and all that, Rhea, but you can't deny that the fucker is dumb. What cheap shit. I can see right through it. Thurston thinks Lem and Damon won't ever vote on the same side. That means the vote will always be three to two, and Thurston and Hugh will always be on the winning side. If the three of you were included, the vote would usually go the other way. That's why they're leaving you out, and that's why I'm walking out. Without me, the vote will always be three to one. They can have it. Didn't Damon say anything, Minnie asked? They can have that bastard too, Alex said. No, he didn't say a word. He just sat there and listened. That's why they wanted him in there instead of you. Alex squeezed my hand and said to me, I'll talk to you some other time, Sophie. I can't stand this place for one second longer. He walked out of the office. I started to cry. The door of the editor's office opened and Lem stepped out, grinning, looking as if he were intentionally trying to confirm Alex's characterization of him. The press is dead. Long live the press, Lem shouted. The three of us didn't respond. We stared at him with intense hostility. He continued, revoltingly self-satisfied. I'd like to announce the birth of a new publication out of the womb of the old. It will be an underground newspaper, and two names were under consideration. The Spark, suggested by me, and Omissions, suggested by Hugh. The majority voted in favor of Omissions, because the specific task of this underground newspaper will be to publish the news which will from now on be omitted from the crippled official newspaper. That's a perfect title for it, I told him. It began its career by omitting half the people who ought to be on it. Rhea got up and started walking slowly toward Lem. She looked as if she intended to strangle him. When she was a foot away from him, she said, through her teeth and with her mouth nearly shut, it was my idea to publish that paper. Then she started trembling. 
I asked her if she was all right. She walked out of the office, her eyes red with rage. She looked hysterical. Today, I think it's strange that Lem and Rita were so committed to that paper. The project with which it was to carry out had much more in common with my outlook than with theirs. It was I who was in favor of printing omitted facts and letting scandalous information speak for itself. Letting facts speak for themselves and letting readers draw their own conclusion conflicted with Lem's and Rhea's political commitments. As soon as Rhea was gone, Lem turned towards me and tried to explain that it hadn't been his idea to exclude anyone. This had already been decided without him. And then he went on to talk about the dangers of publishing and distributing an underground newspaper. Counter-revolutionaries might attack the newspaper headquarters at any time of day or night. Goons might attack us while we were distributing it. I turned my back to him, and he left the newspaper office. Damon came out of the editor's office looking like a dog that had just been beaten, shuffling his feet, his head bobbing from side to side. Thurston came out behind Damon, slapped him on the back, and said, See you next weekend, and rushed out of the office with a victorious grin smeared across his face. Minnie walked towards Damon and shouted, You traitor! Hit him twice across the face so hard that I jumped up both times, and she too rushed out of the office. I remained on the bench, staring at the typewriter I'd used so many times. I turned around when I heard Hugh come out of what had been his office ever since I had been on the staff. He was surprised to see me. In his arms he yelled a large bundle of papers he had collected. He had tears in his eyes. Looking away from me, he said, I'm awfully sorry. He walked away slowly. He was just another student now. To me, he was still the editor. I was alone with the typewriters, the U-shaped desk in the middle of the room, the doors to the editors and managing editors' offices, the pages tacked to the walls with errors circled in red. I cried. I was going to miss the typewriter, the desk, the walls, and the people with whom I had spent so many hectic days. I hadn't felt so lonely, so excluded since the night I had gone to the beach with Ron and Sabina and had walked home by myself after Ron wrecked his father's car. I started to think they would all miss this office. And then the thought passed through my mind that Alec hadn't told us the truth about the meeting that had just taken place in Hugh's office. I convinced myself that they hadn't wanted to exclude Rhea, but rather Minnie and me, and that Rhea had been excluded with us just for the sake of appearances. They had all turned against Minnie and me because we were the ones who had provoked the repression with our articles. I convinced myself we were being blamed for having destroyed the paper for everyone else. I simply couldn't accept Alex's explanation of my exclusion. I couldn't make myself believe that I had been excluded from the underground paper because Thurston was counting votes. I couldn't accept such an explanation because the exclusion meant so much to me and the motives for it were so petty. My exclusion from omissions by my own friends was much more painful to me than my exclusion from the university newspaper by the administration, not only because the newest exclusion was so personal, but because omissions was a project being launched by the people who were going to engage in it whereas the university paper was an institution that existed before any of us had ever joined it. It was not our project. I was hurt because omissions was precisely the kind of project I had hoped I'd find when I first enrolled in the university. It seemed to me then that this project was identical to the project I had taken part in years earlier, with you and Yasna and the others at the carton plant, when we formulated our own goals and strategies, printed our own posters, distributed them ourselves. I was excluded from the only genuine community I had found here, the second community I had found in my whole life. I now recognize the validity of your critique of my earlier activity. I didn't understand the context in which it took place, and I wasn't aware of the motives that animated the people around me. But I don't think you can impute their motives to me. The activity in the carton plant was not a rung of a bureaucratic ladder for me, and unlike Vera and Mark, I haven't risen in any hierarchy. My desire to participate on omissions wasn't motivated by bureaucratic ambitions, I was pained by my exclusion not because it deprived me of opportunities or comforts, but because it deprived me of a project, of a community, of a genuinely independent activity. I sat in that office and cried because my project with you, Yasna, Vera, and Mark was going to remain the only genuine project in which I had taken part. I understand Yasna's narrative. I'm sure I'd be equally disappointed if I learned what the other people on that newspaper staff were doing today. But that's not the point. My point is that the activity I wanted to share with them was not composed of their character traits, any more than the activity at the carton plant was composed of Marx or Vera's bureaucratic ambitions. And no matter what they've become since then, you can't take away from me what I experienced because what I experienced was my project, not their ambitions. What I don't seem able to convey to you is that what I sought all my life is something that's completely my own. It's a significant project within the context of a community. When I tell you that I learned about the possibility of such a project and such a community during those days I spent with you, I'm merely telling you a fact about myself, a detail of my biography, 
I'm not telling this to you in order to glorify those specific people, nor that specific project. The reason I felt so miserable when I was excluded from the off-campus paper was because I was deprived of something I had learned to want many years earlier. It had nothing to do with Vera or Mark's titles. It had to do with activity and with human relationships. What I learned to want didn't have to be related to posters or newspapers. After my exclusion from omissions, I became desperate and I leapt from one world of activity to another in search of such a project and such a community. I sought it with Alec within the university itself, and we both got expelled from school. I sought it by trying to correspond with you and failed to reach you. I sought it in a fictional world that I myself invented, but I never finished my novel. Finally, I went to the underworld where Sabina and her friends were living, still seeking the kind of life I had learned to want during those full few days I spent with you 20 years ago. It was dark when I finally dragged myself out of the newspaper office and back to the co-op. I fell asleep as soon as I got to my room and I slept through most of the following day, a Saturday. Alec came shortly after I woke up. We had supper in a small restaurant and then we took a walk around the campus. It was early spring, as it is now. The campus was deserted. We mechanically retraced the path of the previous day's funeral procession. For a long time, we just walked silently. Then Alec started to express thoughts that perfectly echoed my own. It's funny, he said. I always thought putting out that paper was a lot of hard work, and I never thought all of it was such great fun. Sometimes I even wondered if it was worth all that work. But now that it's over, I don't think I'll be able to stand it around here. I know I won't, I said. I know I'll hate it. We sat down on the steps of the administration building, the very same steps on which the striking students sat a few days ago when Damon lectured to them about the point of production. Why don't we do something together? Just you and I, Alec asked. I was just thinking the same thing, I said. I was thinking about that military professor and his files. You mean writing more articles about him? I'm sick of that, Alec said. But you didn't write a single one of those articles, I reminded him, laughing. No, I wasn't thinking of more articles. I was thinking that you and I could sit in on one of his classes and ask him questions about his files. That wasn't really such a daring suggestion. In recent years, students have planted bombs in such files. Alec was enchanted by my suggestion. That would drive him up a wall, he said. He might even try to exterminate a couple of reds right in the classroom. Doesn't that frighten you? You just said you wouldn't be able to stand it around here if we didn't do something like that, I reminded him. Alec got all excited. If that works out, we could go visit some other classes and do the same thing. I can think of at least a dozen where I'd like to do that. Those smug bastards are always asking if anyone has questions, and they're used to hearing some pipsqueak say he didn't have a chance to write down every one of the professor's words. We'll give them questions. God damn it, maybe some other students will learn how to ask questions. This place would have to shut down. We continued speculating about the possible effects of our activity until late into the night. We decided to launch our project the following Monday. We didn't talk about the kinds of questions we'd ask, nor about what we'd do if we were thrown out or if the professor didn't call on us. We didn't prepare a single thing. We simply decided to sit in on the general's class. That Monday, I decided to skip all my classes again. When Alec came for me at the co-op, I could see that he was as nervous as I. We hardly spoke to each other. We found the room where the general's class was supposed to take place and tried to look inconspicuous. We sat down on the last row. We didn't succeed in our attempt to be inconspicuous. The room gradually filled up with identical-looking young men in suits and ties, all of them short-haired. Alec wore jeans and a t-shirt, and I was the only woman in the room. The students kept turning around and looking at us. Several of them made obscene gestures. I don't know if those gestures meant the students guessed who we were, or if the people in that class were automatically vicious towards women and casually dressed men. They all looked at me like bloodthirsty marines, and I'm sure every single one of them has by now exterminated countless human beings on some distant battlefield. The professor paid no attention to us. He simply pretended we weren't there. He lectured during the whole hour and didn't ask if there were any questions. I couldn't believe that lecture. I had known that such people existed, but I had never spoken to any and never looked at military literature. That man talked about the slaughter of thousands of people as if he were describing a game of chess. If a person who cannot distinguish people from roaches is a psychopath when he starts talking about exterminating the vermin, then this professor was the most dangerous psychopath I had ever seen. I couldn't have asked him a question if I had memorized one. I was frozen in my seat. I imagined myself being exploded into scraps, being burned alive, and being shot full of holes by the weapons he described. I was chilled to the bone. I don't think I've ever been so frightened. When I got home, I vomited. Alec apparently didn't respond to the lecture the way I did. When the hour was nearly over, he became impatient and raised his hand. The professor didn't call on him. So Alex interrupted the lecture and started shouting, Why do you keep talking about such faraway places, Professor? Why don't you describe what those weapons will do right here in this town when you start killing off those enemies you keep files on? 
Tell us about burning out certain parts of the city. Some of us might have relatives there. That'll help us understand your lecture a lot better. Alec was sweating when he finished, and he started shaking like a leaf. The professor paused while Alec spoke, but then he ignored Alec completely and continued his lecture as if he had been interrupted by a psychopath. When the bell rang, he walked up to us, said he didn't remember having seen us in his class before, and asked if we were registered for his course. Alec told him we were considering enrolling the following semester, but before doing so, we had wanted to hear one of his lectures, and having heard it, we were no longer considering enrolling. The professor then said that we couldn't simply walk off the street into a classroom, but that we first had to have permission from the proper authorities. When we left the classroom, five or six of the students were waiting for us. In spite of their suits and ties, they looked like a pack of vicious, bristly-haired dogs. I was scared to death. Ever since that day, I've sympathized with anyone who urged the population to get guns and protect yourselves, even in situations where that slogan was totally inappropriate. And I've certainly sympathized with every gorilla anywhere in the world who ever shot one of those monsters. Alec was scared, too. We didn't exchange any words with them. Alec grabbed my hand, and we started running without looking back to see if they were following. We ran to Alec's car, drove to the co-op, and I rushed to the bathroom and threw up. We didn't know whether to consider the first stage of our project a partial success or a complete failure, and we didn't have time to evaluate it, nor the chance to try another approach. Two days after our visit to the military lecture, one of the city papers carried a long story about our escapade. The story was so distorted that if we hadn't known the mentality of its authors, we wouldn't have recognized ourselves in it. The few facts there were in the story must have come out of the professor's files, and even those facts were wrong. I realized that files we had made so much noise about couldn't have been of much use to anyone. The headline was, Outside Agitators Disrupt University Lecture. The names of the agitators were Minor Vach and Sophia Narcalo, namely the authors of the articles that had appeared in the school paper rendered in the city's reporters or the professor's spelling. The article described the two agitators as the leaders of the cell that had temporarily taken over the student publication. According to the article, the university had taken vigorous measures to remove from the newspaper staff all communists, homosexuals, fellow travelers, and other outside agitators, and had given the publication back to the student community. However, the article observed critically, the university's measures had not been vigorous enough because dangerous elements are still being allowed to run rampant in our university, among our sons and daughters, among tomorrow's leaders. The last paragraph stated that Minor Vach and his consort were obviously no students, but did not explain why this was obvious. Undoubtedly, the name they chose for him made this obvious. The article concluded by describing Minor and his consort as dangerous elements who were intent on disfiguring the minds of the entire younger generation and who would stop at nothing in their determined attempt to bring the university to a complete halt. This article was an example of journalism as it was practiced outside the university. We had been fired from the newspaper staff so as to be replaced by people who aspired to this type of journalism. The following morning, both Alec and I were served subpoenas by the university administration, or something just like that. A messenger brought both of us notes which told us to appear in the office of the president immediately. Alec came over as soon as he got his notice, and we discussed what we would do about it. Our first impulse was to disregard the president's invitation. But on second thought, both of us had wanted to have a taste of that experience. Neither of us had ever seen the university president or his office, and we were certain that whatever happened, it would not be as terrifying as the moment when we left the general's class and faced a pack of his snarling students. We obviously didn't dress up for the occasion, but I must admit that the president as well as the secretary were very open-minded about that. The secretary told us, the president will be right with you. Please sit down, and indicated that we should install our dirty-looking jeans on the plush chairs in the carpeted room. The president came in, introduced himself, and shook our hands while we remained seated. He asked if we wanted coffee. Yes, please, we both answered simultaneously. Later on, Alec told me he wished he thought of asking for breakfast as well. The president himself went out and a few minutes later returned carrying a tray with two cups of coffee, a cream pitcher, and a sugar bowl. Apparently, he wasn't going to join us. Did you summon us here so as to serve us coffee? Alec asked. In a very apologetic tone, the president said, Oh, that note. Yes, it was excessively harsh. We merely wanted to get somewhat better acquainted with you. Then he grinned and added, I hope you don't mind. Oh, not at all, I said. The coffee is very good and the room is nicely decorated. I wouldn't mind coming here every morning. Yes, well, the president continued, I should tell you that I understand you young people perfectly. I was quite a gay blade myself during my college days. Alex snickered and the president paused. However, he then said, you have to understand that we must face certain realities. Alec and I obviously didn't understand that. 
If we did, we wouldn't have been drinking coffee in the president's office. Realities like the present war hysteria, Alec asked. Is this a university or an army barracks? I understand your point perfectly, the president said. However, there are certain political considerations and also certain financial ones. The hysterical politicians could fire you and the war profiteering corporations pay your salary. Is that what you mean? I asked. My comment irritated the president ever so slightly. He said, I can see that you're both reluctant to face these realities. Then he immediately reverted to his original tone. He didn't want us to think he was an evil man. Your point of view is in many ways justified. I might even say admirable. Unfortunately, I have certain responsibilities, and the university has certain responsibilities towards a larger community, and your uncompromising attitude makes it very hard for me and for the university at large to carry out these responsibilities. I got angry and said, if you think we're going to compromise our attitudes, oh no, he interrupted, nothing of the sort. I merely wanted to get better acquainted with you. From my point of view, this interview has been completely satisfactory. He got up and shook her hands again, saying, I honestly wish you the greatest success in your endeavors. I certainly didn't regret having accepted the president's invitation. I had never before met such a completely unprincipled person, such a perfect politician. The following morning, the same messenger who had brought us our invitations brought Alec and me notes informing us that we were being expelled from the university. Neither Alec nor I were terribly upset by our expulsion. We had already felt expelled when the administration directive had closed the newspaper office to us, and neither of us had wanted to remain in the university without working on the newspaper. Alec found an apartment and moved away from campus on the very day the notice came, and a few days later he already had a factory job. He asked me to move to his apartment, but I knew that I'd be making a terrible mistake if I did that. We hadn't ever discussed the question of marriage, and I knew that the day after I moved in with him, it would already be too late to begin that conversation. Besides my lack of desire to become a wife, I didn't want to leave the university environment so quickly for several reasons. First of all, I wanted to see how the purged newspaper functioned, and I also wanted to be on campus when the first issue of Omissions came out. Secondly, I'd start writing my novel again. This time, my experience on the newspaper staff was its central topic, and I was afraid that if I removed myself from that environment, I would lose my desire to continue working on it. The university newspaper didn't come out for a week, but when it did come out, it looked almost the same as when we had put it out. I must admit I was disappointed by this fact. I had thought that somehow its very appearance would reveal what it had become. Bess Locke hadn't merely been accepted onto its staff. She had been appointed news editor, a position which was only one notch lower than her previous position. I assumed that the paper looked so much like ours because Bess had done all the editing as well as the layout, but maybe I gave too little credit to those pliant journalism students picked from the fraternities and sororities. Of course, the paper didn't have the kinds of articles Damon, Alec, Minnie, and I had written, but not all of our issues had carried such articles either, nor had all of our articles been masterpieces. A few days later, the first issue of Emissions came out. I was disappointed by that, too. It was so small, only two letter-sized pages with typewritten articles. But it was beautifully laid out, and the articles were fun to read. I was particularly moved by Hugh's description of the purpose of the paper. Thurston's humor column was hilarious. I had called Minnie to find out if she knew when the first issue was going to come out. She told me that she and Damon had become friends again and that she was going to help distribute the paper. They had been denied the right to distribute the paper on campus, and consequently they were going to give it out across the street from the administration building, namely on the side of the street which was not on university property. I joined Minnie and Damon there, and without even being asked, I grabbed a bundle and gave out copies to the men students who lived in the fraternity houses across the street from the administration building. Hugh and Lem were giving them out at the other end of the campus to students who drove their cars to school. The paper was given out free, like the official paper. The editorial asked people to subscribe to it so as to help defray printing expenses which were being paid by the editors. When we ran out of copies, Damon asked me to come to the next staff meeting at Hugh's house. I didn't say I'd come. I thought of Rhea and Alec. I didn't want to be one of those who had betrayed them, but I couldn't stay away. Minnie and Damon came for me on the day when the second issue was to be laid out. When I walked in with them, Thurston and Hugh acted as if they took my presence for granted. I sat and listened while they discussed the materials to be included in the issue. There were no arguments, no cliques, no majorities or minorities. There was no reason for voting. Hugh asked me to write an article, but that was where I drew the line. I was willing to help with the typing and the distribution, but I refused to become one of the editors. I went out with Alex once a week. I told him I was taking part in the distribution of omissions and gave him a copy whenever it came out. I didn't tell him I was also taking part in the production of the paper. I was ashamed to tell him that. I also felt ashamed at the co-op several times when Rhea saw me go out with Damon and Minnie on our way to Hugh's house. She must have known that I was on my way to work on the off-campus paper originally suggested by her. I took part in the production of the paper, but I continued to be an outsider, 
not only in my own eyes, but in theirs as well. After the second issue, all four editors as well as many urged me to write articles and take part in the decisions, but I continued to refuse. I just couldn't forget the way the paper had been started, and my failure to participate in those activities didn't let them forget either. They hardly spoke to me. They were afraid I'd take offense at something they said, or even at the tone in which they said it. They didn't want me to walk out. The production of that little paper was a lot of hard work, and by the third issue I had become indispensable for the paper's distribution as well. Damon and Lem helped distribute only the first two issues. Both had morning classes every day, and Damon had always been a good student. Lem also went back to being a good student, although I can't imagine why, since he then left the university before finishing the school year. And of course, the upper-class dandy Thurston never took part in the distribution. He had as soon have been a peasant gorilla. Handing out the paper across the street from the university was for Thurston an activity worthy of outside agitators and union organizers, and he was equally hostile to both. The only reason he found himself in our company was that the witch-hunt mentality of that time was even interfering with the ability of the ruling class to make jokes about itself, which was all he wanted to do. As a result, Hugh, Minnie, and I were the paper's only distributors. Minnie and I continued to give it out across the street from the administration building, and Hugh continued to distribute it to commuting students on the other side of campus. How ironic! The argument that had justified our exclusion had been that the distribution of the underground paper would be far too dangerous for the women. I did undergo a terrible experience before the year ended, which I'll describe later, but this experience had not been one of the dangers that had been anticipated when our exclusion had been justified. There were numerous favorable responses to the publication of omissions, several encouraging letters, some classroom discussions of questions raised by omissions, a certain growth of political awareness on the official newspaper staff, which would not have taken place if omissions hadn't been published and if it hadn't maintained such a high level of quality. I'll only describe one of the responses because it's related to events that took place long after the first omissions had been forgotten. Around the middle of the year, we learned that a group of students at another university had heard about our series of articles in the school paper, about the directive and about the mock funeral. One of those students was one of the first paying subscribers to omissions. Stimulated by our example, these students launched a similar publication, which they also named omissions. They were not former editors of the official publication. The official paper of that university had apparently always been as self-repressed as the one here became after the directive. Another difference was that the kinds of articles they carried were not at all like those that appeared in our omissions, but rather like the articles Minnie and I had been publishing in the official paper just before the directive. They were exposures of the militaristic and repressive engagement of professors and academic departments. That group of students didn't disperse at the end of the school year the way we did. They kept their publication going. Its staff as well as its readers increased. Its name changed several times. New students replaced those who graduated. Several years later, the entire editorial board of that publication got themselves elected to the student government. It was the first time within memory that radical students had been so prominent. These students became the first official spokesmen of what became the student movement. I learned all this many years after the demise of the original missions when I re-enrolled in college. I'm mentioning all this because I do understand what you mean when you describe our activity in the carton plant or mine on the newspaper staff as a stepping stone towards a political career. That's what it was for Mark Glavney, Vera Nice, and the group of students I've just described. But the activity was not a stepping stone in and of itself, and I'm not the only one who knows this. Nowadays, when the student movement is vast, several of its politicians are writing the history of their movement. They invariably identify the origin of the present movement with the publication of the first issue of the omissions that was published at the other university, which came out several months after our first issue. There's a very good reason why they locate the origin there. That group was a group of politicians, and the historians are politicians writing the history of their likes. They don't mention our activities because we weren't politicians, because we spoke only for ourselves. They know it, I know it, and I think you should know it too. If our activity were ever included in a history, it wouldn't be a history of politicians, but a much vaster history of people's attempts to fight against repression on their own, for themselves, without politicians. Our activity had innumerable flaws. Our motives weren't pure and our achievements weren't terribly impressive, but the establishment of political careers was not what motivated us and that certainly wasn't what we achieved as a result of that activity. Some months before the end of the school year, Lamassell announced that he would be leaving the admissions staff as well as the university. He was one of the students selected by his political organization to attend a world student conference which was to take place in your part of the world. 
I had thought Lem had left that organization when he had joined the omission staff and had a falling out with Rhea, but I had been wrong. To his credit, he hadn't once let his organizational commitment define his relations to the other people on the staff. I reluctantly admitted to myself that Thurston's calculations had not been altogether without substance. If Lem and Rhea had both been on that staff, they would have blackmailed each other into implementing the organization's position on every question. Not that their positions would always have been wrong. They would have always been rigid, inflexible, and consequently the discussions wouldn't have had the character of genuine communication, but of people shouting at phonograph records that just keep repeating themselves. But even that would have been preferable to the exclusionary course that was taken. Lem's coming trip gave me an idea. I asked him if he'd be willing to deliver letters to all the friends I had known eight years earlier. I didn't tell him we had all been arrested. I was afraid Lem would suspect there was something wrong with my friends, that they were all stained as you put it in your second letter. Lem was delighted by the fact that I asked him for a favor. I hadn't asked him to do anything for me since high school. He was also enthusiastic about the prospect of meeting people who had once been my friends, and was positively enchanted when I told him they were all workers. I had two weeks to write letters to all of you, and except for the day I spent working on omissions and the morning I spent distributing it, I had done nothing else during those weeks. The uprising in Magarna had just broke out. Lem had told me something about that uprising, and the city papers carried front-page articles about it, which conflicted in, in every detail with Lem's account. I suspected that both accounts were wrong, and some of the description in the city papers gave me the impression that the Magarna Rising was in some ways a continuation of our activity in the carton factory eight years earlier. In fact, the vehemence with which Lem denied certain details even led me to suspect that the events unfolding in Magarna went far beyond anything I had experienced, that in fact a revolution was taking place, which was as extensive and profound as the revolution Louisa had described to me. Those suspicions were of course confirmed in later years, when I read documented accounts of the Magarna revolution, but at the time I had no way of learning those facts. The closest I could come was to reach you. I feverishly wrote long letters to every one of you. Once I wrote straight through the night and continued writing the whole next day. The letter to you was the longest. In my recent letters I've repeated most of what I told you then. I described the extent to which two key events had affected my life, the revolution with which Louisa had familiarized me, and the agitation in which I myself took part with you and the others in the carton plant. I told about my lifelong search for the elements which had made those experiences significant to me. I narrated all I've just finished telling you about my activity on the newspaper staff and the off-campus paper, and I summarized my early attempt to compare you to Iran. I was eager to hear about your life and the lives of others, about your experiences, activities, and projects. I wanted to hear about the rising in Magarna. I was sure those events were giving a new life to the community I'd once known. I wanted desperately to be in touch with those of my friends who were closest to it. I wanted to be part of it and part of them. At that time, I felt that I was still an integral part of that community. I still thought of myself as one of you. If I had gotten your newest letter and read Yasna's account then, I would have been heartbroken. I imagined all of you were still in the carton plant. I had no way of knowing what dreadfully long prison terms so many of you had served already then. I obviously thought of all of you as I remembered you, as you had been when I had known you. When I wrote those letters, there was nothing I wanted more than to be asked to return by one and all of you. My letters almost begged for such an invitation. In each letter, I described my life since my immigration as the life of a foreigner, the life of an outsider. I described the environment and the population that welcomed me with the slogan, go back to where you came from, and the university in which I had never been anything more than an outside agitator. I also described my exclusion from the single activity I had found here, which I would have embraced as my own, the off-campus newspaper. I waited for a letter a postcard, a word, or a mere sign. I was ready to fly out of here as abruptly as Alec had left the university on the day of our expulsion. But no word came. Even Lem didn't return. When I finally did see Lem again several years later, his account of what happened to him was so unrelated to the letters I had written that I barely listened to what he told me. I was convinced it had nothing to do with me. Poor Lem. Soon after Alec and I were expelled, I started my novel again, for the second and last time. How well I understand why Yasna reads long novels whenever she's excluded from the activity of those around her, to live all the possible lives she knows she'll never have a chance to live. I suppose I wrote for similar reasons. Unlike Yasna, I didn't wander through worlds others had created. I wandered through my own, and while wandering, I changed it here and there to make it more like the world I would have wanted it to be. I spent almost every day working on it, alone in my room at the co-op. 
I saw the omissions people only one day every two weeks, and at no other time, since the activity that drew us together on that single day, the preparation of the paper, was the very activity that separated us the rest of the time. I saw Alec on weekends. During the week, the job he'd gotten used up all his energy, and he simply ate, slept, and went back to work. I was glad to be left alone in my room. I was close enough to the people and the experiences I was writing about to continue to be stimulated by them, while at the same time I was able to look at them from a distance, the distance which my exclusion had created between us. My second novel wasn't a love story, but the story of two projects. Ron was replaced by the group of people with whom I had shared the experience of the newspaper staff, the people who had excluded me from omissions. I contrasted this project and these people with my experience at the carton factory eight years earlier. I described the first group as a genuine community, one which could not have excluded me, and I tried to explore the reasons for my exclusion from omissions, reasons which I didn't locate in Thurston's vote counting, but in the character of the participants. Since I was using my experience with you as a model, I obviously glorified the people I had known in the carton plant, as well as the project I had shared with them. Yasna's account of who those people really were and what they've become since then is not really relevant to the way I described them. The characters of my novel were products of my own imagination. In a sense, my characters were all different facets of my own self. Through them, I contrasted the pettiness of those around me with a picture of what I would have wanted those people to be. Through those characters, I tried to say that the world around me was not the only possible world, and certainly not the best of all possible worlds. I never accepted Damon's philosophy according to which all that happens is explainable afterwards as all that was objectively possible. Now I understand why Damon hadn't sent a word when Rhea, Minnie, and I had been excluded from omissions. With all its revolutionary language, Damon's philosophy was merely another version of the submissiveness to fate which you attribute to Myrna's mother. By describing characters who in some way resembled you and Vera and Mark, I was trying to depict a possible community. I wasn't trying to describe a community that had actually existed, precisely because I didn't submit to the flawed community that existed as the only objectively possible community. Unfortunately, my second novel never became more complete than my first. I was forced to abandon it abruptly, and I've never returned to it. I reread it before writing you about my experiences on the newspaper staff, and I have to admit that some of the events I have just described come directly out of that manuscript. I apologize for that, but I can no longer remember the sequence of the actual events. My project was cut short by an incident which I do remember, and very vividly. It happened several weeks after Len left with the letters I wrote to all of you. Minnie and I were distributing copies of the newest issue of omissions across the street from the administration building. The students who came out of the fraternity houses lined up for copies. Minnie and I were delighted. We thought there had been a revolution in the fraternity houses. On all previous occasions, only an occasional student had been willing to accept a copy. Others had either insulted us or had avoided walking near us. Since we were surrounded by people reaching for copies, we couldn't see what was happening. Suddenly we heard the siren of a police car. The students around us moved some distance away, and we saw that copies of omissions were scattered all over the street and sidewalk, over the lawn of the administration buildings, on the hoods, and in the door handles of cars. Minnie and I just stood there, holding bundles of copies of the publication that was scattered like fallen leaves all over the landscape. The police grabbed us and pushed us into their car. The whole thing had obviously been prearranged, probably by the university administration, since the events which followed were clearly parts of a scheme that had been well worked out ahead of time. Those fraternity boys were always such good students. It's too bad that word like scab doesn't exist for them. At the police station, we were asked our names. The police called someone in the university, gave our names, and learned that I was no longer a student. We were given a long lecture, which was directed only at me, about littering and defacing public and private property. We were told that if we ever littered the street again, we would have to appear before a judge and be subject to a jail sentence. This obviously meant that we could be jailed for trying to distribute omissions again. Minnie was called into the university president's office and reprimanded, but she wasn't suspended from school. What happened to me was much worse. The co-op where I lived was governed by a board, which consisted of four students who were elected by all the occupants. Two days after the littering incident, the university administration sent the co-op board a threatening note which said that university-approved houses is intended exclusively for the use of students and not for the general public. The university cannot grant recognition to facilities which are run like hotels or other public accommodations. In other words, if I wasn't evicted from the co-op, the co-op would lose university recognition. I still haven't learned what university recognition is. I think that without it, the co-op would not have been placed on the list of university-approved student housing facilities. But no one was in the co-op because it was university-approved. We were there because it was cheap. 
The co-op board called for a meeting of all the occupants. No one had ever been evicted from the co-op before. Numerous students went to school one semester and worked one semester so that I wasn't the only non-student living there. But as soon as the board members started speaking, I knew that the whole business revolved around me. One of the board members said that the loss of university recognition would do irreparable damage to the co-op. And two others said that it would do irreparable damage to the careers of all the students in the co-op. The three board members who spoke, the fourth didn't say anything, were law students. This was not a coincidence. Law students were normally the only people who ran for board posts. No one else wanted to be a board member. The law students listed the fact that they had been on the board of directors of the university cooperative dormitory on their list of accomplishments. They were politicians. I had heard that when the co-op was first organized, it had been a center for radical students, but this had ceased to be the case long before I had come there. These board members apparently thought that my presence there was going to revive that long lost reputation of the co-op. In that case, they would no longer be able to list the co-op among their accomplishments. It's in this sense that my presence there was harmful to their careers. There was a very brief discussion. Only two students expressed oppositions to the university's threatening note. The others just sat and said nothing. I looked desperately towards Rhea. She would be the next one whose presence would be harmful to the lawyer's careers, but she avoided my glance and said nothing. It all happened so fast that I couldn't put my thoughts together. Someone called for the vote. I started to say, but you can't. I couldn't say any more. I gagged and started sobbing. They voted. Two students voted against my eviction, about a third of the students abstained, and all the rest, including Rhea, raised their hands in favor of evicting me. That was Rhea's revenge for the fact that Alec had abandoned her as well as her organization, and probably also for the fact that she had been excluded from, from what was, in a way, her creation, the off-campus paper. With that vote, she was also getting even with herself for having admired this perfect proletarian so much when we first met. Perhaps in some strange way, she was also acting as the instrument of Debbie Matthews' revenge against George Alberts, although Rhea couldn't have known about my connection to Alberts. I understood how Debbie must have felt when she was fired, and particularly when she learned the role her former friend had played in the firing. After that horrid vote, I started to bawl. Everyone left the room. Not one person stayed with me, even to console me. I felt like a leper. I dragged myself to my room and cried myself to sleep, exactly the way I had done when I'd been excluded from omissions. When I woke up in the morning, I started crying again. How terribly cruel it is to evict someone. I looked helplessly at my familiar room, at my unfinished manuscript, at my stack of newspapers. I had nowhere to go and wasn't able to go anywhere else, even if I had wanted to. I had no money. I'd had a tuition scholarship during my three and a half years in school, and my room and board at the co-op had been free. Louisa had given me money when I had started college, but I had always returned it because I really hadn't needed it. The little I had kept when Louisa insisted was in a savings account, and I hadn't spent any of it, but all my savings couldn't have paid for a single week's rent and food. I didn't have much to pack except manuscripts, notebooks, newspapers, and books. I hadn't bought clothes since high school, and some of them were so old I stuck them into the garbage instead of packing them. I went to the bus station and stuck all my belongings inside a locker. I wandered around the ugly station and walked aimlessly amidst the crowd on the downtown streets. I was like a person who had just arrived in the city, a person who didn't know what she would do here, whom she'd meet, and what she'd become. I went to a drugstore and sipped a cup of coffee. It was only then that I started to think about what I would do next. But I couldn't think about it coherently. Images kept flying through my mind. Images of the disappointing funeral procession, of Alec telling us why we'd been excluded from omissions, of Rhea's hand raised in favor of my eviction. The most obvious thing would have been to go to Louisa, but I couldn't stand the thought of doing that. I knew I'd spent all my time sitting in my room staring at the walls the way I had done before I started high school. In that room, I wouldn't be able to continue my novel about the university paper, and I certainly wouldn't pull out the manuscript of my first novel. And the thought of breaking down and bawling in front of Louisa frightened me. It would create a relationship that hadn't existed between us for as long as I could remember, I would become a helpless and dependent child, and she'd become my protective mother. I didn't know if she was able to play that role, but if she did play it, I knew I'd hate her afterwards because I'd be terribly humiliated to have to assert my independence again. I could have gone to Alec. He had already asked me to move in with him, but in the state I was in, that would have been even worse than returning to Louisa. Helpless and completely lost, I would automatically have become his burden and his responsibility. I can imagine him saying, just go ahead and cry on my shoulder, Sophie. Everything's going to be all right. Soon I'd be his wife and then his old lady. By then, any kind of separation would be extremely painful, if not altogether impossible. 
I had decided not even to contact Alec until I had solved my living problems. Of course, I could have thought of going to work like any normal person, but I had never worked before, and the mere thought of looking for a job made me feel like vomiting. Is this revulsion a trait I share with the people Yasna described, or does it have something to do with the nature of work in this society? Well, I would have been delighted to put me up, and I could easily have dispelled any expectations he might have had, but Lem was by then in your part of the world, and I didn't want to seek help from any of the others on the admissions staff. My exclusion from the paper was far too similar to my eviction from the co-op. While I was considering and rejecting all of these alternatives, the solution was already in the back of my mind. I would turn to Sabina. At that moment, it seemed that she was the only person in the world I could turn to. She wouldn't become my protectress. I could come and go as I pleased, and when I pleased, and I knew she wouldn't turn me away. I had no idea where Sabina was. I hadn't seen her for two years since the night she had come to the co-op to tell me Ron had been killed. I didn't even know how to start looking for her. I had a hunch, and it turned out to be right. I suspected that she was still together with Ron's friends, or even that she was directly in contact with Debbie Matthews, since that was probably how she had learned of Ron's death. I also remember that Sabina had once stayed at Debbie's house. Debbie Matthews suddenly became very important to me. I hadn't ever gone to see her when she'd been fired from high school, and I particularly regretted not having gone to her when I'd learned about Ron's death. I became so convinced that Debbie would know where Sabina was that I returned to the bus station and took my things back out of the locker. It was still morning when I rang the bell at the Matthews house, hugging all my possessions. Debbie opened the door. We had seen each other at Ron's trial, but she didn't recognize me. She asked what I wanted. She was drunk. I told her I was Lemon Sell's friend and Sabina Natchelo's sister, that I had once gone with Ron, and that I was desperately trying to find Sabina. You're the other Albert's girl, she exclaimed, but she asked me in anyways. As soon as I was in the living room, I became hysterical. I shouted that I wasn't George Albert's girl, that Albert's had never been either my friend or my father, and that I hated him as much as she did. I told her I hated Albert's more than ever at that very moment, because Debbie's own friends, Lamisel and Rhea Morphin, had done to me exactly what Albert's had done to her. I bawled. I acted out the very scene I hadn't wanted to perform for Louisa. I told her about Lem's role in my exclusion from omissions and about Rhea's role in my eviction from the co-op. I told her Sabina was the last person I had left in the world and I had no idea what would happen to me if I didn't find her. Debbie poured me a drink and said almost exactly what I would have expected Alice to say if I had gone to him. Take it easy, kid. Everything is going to be all right. There's no reason to have a fit. That won't help any. She left the room to wash and put on a dress. She looked almost sober when she returned. Come on, she said. Their garage is right down the street. I've never gone there before. Now's as good a time as any. When we left her house, she carried most of my packages. I must have been the one who looked drunk. By the time we reached the garage, I might as well have been in a foreign land where I knew neither the language nor the customs. I had cried so much that day that a film of tears had formed in my eyes and everything looked distorted. I was like a person walking in her sleep or under hypnosis. Nothing would have surprised me. I had stopped responding to what was happening around me. One of the mechanics ran up to Debbie and asked, Is something wrong? Debbie answered, Not with me. This girl says she's Sabina's sister. She needs a place to stay. So you're Sophie, the mechanic said. Ron never stopped talking about you. I remember seeing you at his trial. I remember seeing him too. He was Jose. Pointing to the other two mechanics, he said, That's Vic Turham over there, and this is Ted Nazavu. I remember Ted, I said, trying to smile. He's the car thief Ron told me about. Jose looked embarrassed by my comment. Apparently, Debbie didn't know what kind of garage it was. I wanted to apologize, but just then a little girl ran up to us. She must have been six years old. Jose told Debbie and me, this is Ron's kid. Debbie embraced the little girl and said, she sure doesn't look like him. It was Tina. I hadn't seen her since she'd been a bundle on the couch in George Albert's house. Tina ran into the house and a few minutes later returned with Sabina. As soon as I saw Sabina, I ran to her and threw my arms around her. I hadn't been so glad to see anyone since the night, four years earlier, when Sabina had thrown pebbles at my window, the night when she and Ron had come to tell me about Ron's experiences in reform school. I held on to Sabina and let all the rest of my tears run down her shoulder. I've been excluded from everything I sobbed. I'm a complete outsider. Sabina loosened herself from my embrace. I saw that there were tears in her eyes. She put her arm around me and helped me to the apartment behind the garage. After letting me down on a kitchen chair, she went back to the garage to ask Debbie if she wanted to join us for coffee. Debbie apparently didn't want to be entertained by both Albert's girls because Sabina came back alone. 
She gave me a wet towel so I could wipe the streams of tears off my face. Then she gave me a cup of strong black coffee and a bowl of thick soup. I felt much better, though I was still as disoriented as a tourist in an exotic land. A young woman, or rather a girl, she couldn't have been over fourteen, burst into the kitchen from another room, rushed to the stove and poured herself coffee. Her hands trembled and she had dark rings around her eyes. Sabina said, Tissy, this is Sophia. She's going to stay with us. Tissy turned to me and said, So you're the college sister. And she abruptly left the room with her cup of coffee. I asked Sabina if Tissy was sick, and Sabina said, very matter-of-factly, She's a heroin addict. I'd never seen a heroin act before. Sabina told me there was an extra bed in her room as well as in Tina's room and suggested I stay in Tina's room because Sabina slept during odd hours. I asked Sabina if she took part in it in the car thefts. Not anymore, she said. It's mainly Ted who does that. Tina helps fix the cars up. She's getting quite good at it. Vic specializes in heroin. He sold it to the rich at a bar run by a friend of his and to the poor right in the garage. Tissy came back in the room and poured herself another cup of coffee. Tissy and I work in the bar, Sabina continued. Tissy turned to Sabina and said, You have to bring your sister along and show her what we do. Sabina snapped at Tissy. Sophia can do whatever the hell she wants, and I'm not taking her anywhere. When Tissy left again, I asked what kind of work they did. It's like everything else we do here, Sophia, Sabina answered. It's easier than many other things. It pays better than most. There's no drudgery. Sometimes there's a lot of adventure, and we can work whenever we please. I didn't ask Sabina if she and Tissy were waitresses. I said, I don't mind, you know. I came to ask for help. I haven't come to judge you. Don't you worry about me, she said. Why don't you go get some sleep? You look just like a heroin addict. Sabina was right. I was exhausted. I fell asleep as soon as I lay down. When I woke up, Tina was already asleep. I went to the kitchen to find something to eat. It was past midnight. Tissy was sitting at the kitchen table, sipping her coffee. You sleep all day, sis? she asked. So did I. I'm getting a late start. Want to come along? To the bar, I asked, looking around nervously. Where's Sabina? She must have left two or three hours ago, Tissy said. She'll never take you there. She told me. Want to come? I don't have a dress, I said. I was afraid. But I was also curious. All day long I had felt like a tourist, but I had been too upset and too tired to absorb my new surroundings. After having slept, I felt refreshed and wanted to see more. You can wear one of Sabina's dresses. She's got dozens and we trade all the time. She'll never miss it, Tissy said. I can't say that I was intrigued by the prospect, because that would suggest a much more active state than the one I was in. I was halfway in a stupor. I think at the moment I would have let anyone take me anywhere. I wanted to see whatever there was to be seen, to take part in everything those around me did. As we left the garage, Tissy told me, Don't you ever let them know I took you there. Neither Sabina nor Jose nor Ted. They'll give me hell. Won't Sabina see me there? I'm telling you, she'll never know unless you tell her. The only bar I had ever been to before was a bar near campus where Alec had taken me. Students drank beer there, sitting on plastic-covered seats watching television. The bar I entered with Tissy looked like my idea of a nightclub. There were chandeliers, live musicians, and a singer, plush chairs, and professional waiters. I had never seen anything so luxurious. Tissy placed me on a stool at one end of the bar. But what am I supposed to do, I asked her. It'll all come to you, sis, she said patronizingly, and walked off to talk to someone. I must have gone into a trance. When I came out of it, I found myself inside a chauffeur-driven car. Next to me sat a large, middle-aged man who must have been a city politician or a corporation executive. Absolute chaos swept through my mind. I started to shake with fear. The chauffeur, the man next to me, the noise, the neon signs, the car lights all terrified me. I felt my heart pounding in my stomach and I wanted to vomit. The man must have noticed my agitation. Something wrong with you, he asked. I don't think I've ever thought so quickly in a crisis. Yes, I said. I forgot my tranquilizer pills. I've got to stop at a drugstore. He had the driver pull over by a drugstore, but then he said, I need cigarettes anyways. I'll get your pills. What kind are they? Oh, I have a prescription for them, I said as calmly as I could, and I'm the only one who can use it. I'll get your cigarettes. He started reaching for his wallet, but I jumped out of the car before he had a chance to give me the cigarette money. I immediately wished I had asked what brand he smoked, or at least waited for the money. I was afraid he'd come running after me. I tried to walk as nonchalantly to the drugstore entrance, but as soon as I was inside, I ran to the white frock man behind the counter. He was alone. I started shaking him by the shoulder. Someone's after me, I stammered. Please, where's your back door? The poor druggist looked as frightened as he might have looked if someone were holding him up. I supposed he was glad that I wasn't asking him for his money. He rushed to the back door, frantically undid several bolts, and removed an iron bar. Holding onto the bar, he opened the door and peeked out to see if anyone was in the alley. I suppose he thought I might be luring him into an ambush. Satisfied that there was no one there, he opened the door. I bolted through it without thanking him. 
I ran through alleys and along deserted streets like a hunted animal. I wanted to run to the university co-op to my familiar surroundings, but that was no longer my world. I ran to the garage and pounded hysterically on the door. Jose let me in. He and Ted were still working. God damn it, Jose murmured. Did Tizzy already take you there, or was it Sabina? I suddenly felt terribly ashamed. I had betrayed my new hostesses. Please don't mention this to Sabina or Tizzy. Nothing at all happened, I said. I got scared and ran away. Jose and Ted both laughed. Then Ted said, good for you, kid. Jose said, look, Sabina should have told you this. No one around here expects you to do any work. Ron's girl is our guest. Do you understand that? I was hurt and humiliated by Jose's statement. I was to be a guest, a permanent visitor. I was an outsider again, only a few hours after my arrival. But I just couldn't make myself do the things that would have made me part of that community. Those things may have been part of Ron's world, but they had not been the part I had sought when I had gone walking and riding with him. I couldn't turn myself into a professional prostitute. Why? Is it really because of what you and Yasna say in your letter? Is it really because my activities in the carton plant spoiled me, turned me into a traitor against my class, and taught me to seek my role above my class? I didn't think so that night when I ran back to the garage, and I still don't think so. I didn't think that by leaving the university I'd abandon the opportunist and rejoin the working class, nor did I think that it was opportunistic to refuse to engage in Tissy and Sabina's activity. For you, it's so clear and obvious where the opportunism lies. For me, it's not nearly as obvious. My activities on the newspaper staff didn't give me money or fame, and they didn't secure my future rise in any bureaucratic hierarchy, where Sabina's activity would have given me money, probably a car of my own, as well as a certain type of adventure. It's not that I consider Sabina an opportunist. She's always wanted to immerse herself in everything, to try everything out, to live every possible adventure. She never drew any lines. She never established any limits. I always did. Yet even though I was the one who drew the lines, she was ultimately more principled because the lines I drew were arbitrary. I dreaded selling my mind, time, and energy, yet eventually I did sell these parts of myself. I nevertheless convinced myself that selling my body was worse, and I drew the line there because that's where the ruling morality draws it. The activities I had left were the activities I wanted. To me, those activities had something to do with what was happening in Magarna. They were the kinds of projects I try to describe in my novel, and in the letters I wrote to all of you. It was for the sake of such projects and such a community that I rejected the world to which Tissy introduced me. After my experience at the carton plant, I was never able to find anything that resembled the kind of project I had sought, and when something like it was born with omissions, I was excluded. What I sought is unfolding around you right now, and your letters tell me everything I stand for is alien to that activity. All right. Maybe that's what I've become, and maybe that's what I've always been. But I want you to know that from the bottom of my heart, I hope you and your friends are now creating the community I sought in every environment down to the underworld. The community I tried to invent in my novel because I never found it in my life. My love to Yasna, Mirna, Yara, and you. Sophia.